Wow, hello everyone. Hello. Now, I'm really looking forward to going home next week in Boston and celebrating the birthday of my daughter Maya. And, uh, you know, who here gets excited about planning a themed birthday party for their kids or their nephews or nieces? And who gets really intimidated? <laughs> so imagine I can just use, you know, the target AI agent, Nia, and just say, hey, Nia, help me plan my eight-year-old Maya's birthday party. And what Nia would do behind the scenes is, you know, look at all Maya's photos in the past, what she likes, what her friends like, what's the cultural trend, and personalize it based on her likes, the cultural trends, what's in my house, and of course, what's available in the target supply chain. So that's a lot of AI for Nia to look at the data, the models, the incentivization, and UX. And what I want the target AI to do is not sell me a product, but really buy my need. So let's, you know, before we get into this futuristic scenario, let's look at what's happening uh, in AI. So we're talking about generative AI, uh, large language models. Is that leading to AGI, artificial general intelligence? You know, which field is going to get disrupted by AI next, and which jobs are getting replaced? Uh, what's the difference between digital AI and dimensional AI? And finally, how will this all play out in the retail tech? Now, how many here have used uh, ChatGPT? Right? How many people are excited about it? And how many people are scared? Right? So now ChatGPT is just the tip of the iceberg because it's only looking at the surface web, something you can access basically without using you know, a password. Uh, Wikipedia, research articles, and so on. But if you really have to help Maya celebrate her birthday, we really have to focus on the decentralized AI because the data that's not available in highly personal, highly private data sets. Uh, enterprise data, you know, health records, trade secrets, pricing data, and so on. So that's really the deep web we're talking about. So let's think about, you know, we are excited about how AI, like the dominoes of various fields are falling. In the beginning, we thought it's all about data, and data drives AI, and that's only partially true. The right way to think about the, the revolution in AI is about whether a simulation is possible or not. So something like chess, where the rules are very well understood, you know, Gary Kasparov was beaten in late 90s by IBM Blue, because the simulation is known. In areas where simulation is only approximately known, such as human language model, you know, only now we are seeing you know, some progress. But areas where simulation is unknown, such as drug discovery, you know, uh, black swan events, and so on, you know, we are still a long way to go. And in terms of which jobs AI can replace, you know, we think about, we thought about big data, but then the jobs that require just information, like segmentation clustering, got di displaced. Uh, and now as we move into a knowledge economy, and I would really call it the wisdom economy, because knowledge is about prediction, and wisdom is about planning, causality, counterfactuals, persuasion, navigation, negotiation. Uh, but that's still a long way to go into what, you know, a job that involves deploying, you know. And the deployment involves risk rewards, human values, cultural values, motivation, and so on. So that's how this progress is, is making, and we are in the kind of the uh, knowledge, um, uh, information knowledge boundary. Uh, in terms of AI. What about digital AI versus dimensional AI? Now, Ray Kurzweil predicted by 2029, 20, uh, computers will become, computers will be as smart as humans. And so those are the years I'm using for illustration, and he may be almost, uh, he might be right you know, almost to the year. Now, the human 
the computers that are becoming as smart as human, and for human sensor AI, you know, is making rapid progress. And we might surpass that by 2029 or 2030. But what's also happening is dimensional AI, where ability to explore and exploit with sensors and actuation, uh, which is what required in many fields, is the dimensional AI. It's the multidimensional aspect of it. And that requires you know, different types of sensors and actuators, and that progress is also breathtaking. So a lot of my work uh, at MIT uh, is really about this dimensional AI. And then, if we, if we take all these components coming together, we can start thinking about, you know, kind of Maya's uh, birthday party. So, uh, you know, imagine I can, um, you know, ask Nia, saying, hey, tell me how I would celebrate my birthday party, uh, and I just hold my immersive 3D, um, and, you know, the target AI has already scanned my house, all the objects, all the items that are being sold, uh, you know, in the target uh, supply chain, uh, and I can start visualizing that, you know. Uh, also, it's going to create a generative AI of all the kids uh, and the cake and the food. Uh, and I can visualize what that is. And that requires us to use the simulation, right? So to create immersive experiences, we'll have to start scanning objects and homes and stores and so on. Um, so let's think about kind of the future, kind of next five to 10 years of some kind of extreme imaging and computer vision that would be required uh, to support that. First of all, can you see around corners? Because you know, if you are using you know, Apple's room scan or any 3D scanners, your intention is just walk around and scan in 3D as if stitching a panorama, but then you can't see under the table, behind the couch, you know, around the corner, and so on. So what kind of future imaging would, would do that? Um, can you see around corners beyond line of sight? So this is what we worked on at MIT for the last 10 years. And the idea is to use multipath analysis. Those of you who worked in communication are very familiar with MIMO and, and multipath analysis. By exploiting multiple bounces of light, you, know, you can shine light on the door, it bounces into the room, comes back to the door, and after third bounce, back to the camera. And by analyzing the multiple bounces of light, you can see around corners. But to do that, we need new types of cameras, new types of photography, which we call femtophotography. And this is a movie we created about 10 years ago uh, on a camera that runs not at a million or a billion, but one trillion frames per second. Camera so fast that we can see light in slow motion. So let me show you a movie uh, of that. So if you're going to shire, shine a bullet of light uh, into uh, this Coke bottle with some milky water, and you can see these photons propagating along this Coke bottle, and most of them go in the center and hit the cap of the bottle and light scatters everywhere. Uh, as you can see, the energy fronts on the table, uh, and there's a light bouncing around in the tiny air gap uh, at the top. And after many picoseconds, uh, the light also converges back at the back of the bottle because of the parabolic curvature of the front of the bottle. Now, this whole phenomenon takes up, takes in about one nanosecond. But because I'm slowing this movie by a factor of 10 billion, you know, you can watch it over 10 seconds, right? Now, this is a fantastic piece of technology that we created, invented, wrote many papers, uh, and so on. The interesting thing is this tiny dot that you see on an iPhone, not the three lens, three cameras, but one tiny dot, has very similar capability, although not as good as what we had 10 years ago, but within a factor of 100, just about two orders of magnitude. So you can imagine very quickly in the next few years, you know, this will get to this quality of, of imaging. But once you do that, we can actually start seeing around corners, beyond line of sight. This is not science fiction anymore. So I'll show you a quick movie of this works. So we're going to, again, this is a laboratory setup. This video is about 10 years old. Uh, you send a packet of photons, a bullet of light, uh, from uh, a laser source, just like this one. Uh, it hits the wall, um, and those packet of photons scatter in a spherical shell. Uh, and they start going in various directions. They hit the head and the shoulder and the knees of this mannequin, and they each in turn create spherical shells. And some of them come back to the wall, and they start coming back to the camera. But the interesting part here is that each of the photons reaches the camera with a slightly different time instant. Right? It's like echoes of light. And because they arrive at a slightly time distance, and the camera has a time resolution, 
of roughly a trillion frames per second, you know, that's about one or two picoseconds, we can distinguish these photons that are coming from the head and the shoulder and the knee of the mannequin. So we can shine this laser beam on different spots on the wall and start creating full 3D shapes of this mannequin, although it's completely out of line of sight. So each image that's recorded looks like an ultrasound scan or an MRI scan without it's all stitched together. But then mathematically, we can take all those uh, all those images, you know, which can easily be a gigabyte within a second, uh, and then create you know full 3D shapes of of what's around the corner. So because now we can start creating 3D shapes, you can really uh, you know exploit this extreme imaging in unique ways. You can you know shine lasers to look for you know survivors in hazardous conditions for rescue. You can create new kind of endoscopes to see uh, deep inside the body, or use lasers to see around corners to avoid collision uh, for vehicles, and so on. So this is, this is fantastic. What about mirrors and glass? Because you know, birthday parties involve a lot of, you know, lot of glitter, and your own houses will have this, uh, these, uh, these challenging objects. And traditionally, it's very challenging to use a LiDAR, which is shining light onto an object and looking at you know the speed of uh, looking at the photons returning uh, at the speed of light, um, but with glasses and mirrors it's very challenging. So again, our group has been working on how can you scan very complex objects as well. And finally, um, if you want to make this invisible visible, seeing around corners, you still have a challenge in case of the store where you might have RFID objects in different aisles, or you might have RFID objects inside your house. And you want to be able to simply walk around and create 3D locations and completely tag them, uh, you know, even though you cannot see them with your camera. So again, this is an RFID reader with RFIDs you know, in each of, the, each of the apparel. Of course, with the camera, you can create you know, an immersive 3D map uh, of the store or of the house, which is straightforward. But what's magical is that within that 3D visualization of the store, you can also see the location of each of the objects in your house, in your table, in your kitchen, and so on. So this is actually work by my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Fadal Adib, also uh, at MIT Media Lab, uh, and the company is called Cartesian Systems. So this kind of extreme imaging is critical if you want to really celebrate those birthdays. Now, let's talk about areas where a simulation is only partially known. And we already talked about ChatGPT, uh, as an example uh, of that. But there are more areas where we would like to explore this. Uh, and Neha this morning talked about using uh, agent-based modeling uh, for simulating uh, crowd behavior. Now, to simulate heterogeneous populations that represent complex time-varying actions and interactions, uh, there's a whole new technique that has emerged called agent-based modeling. Um, and traditionally, agent-based modeling could assign one agent for each customer, or one agent for each location, uh, and would only handle you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of such agents. Now, what our team has been able to do uh, is create millions of agents, you know, tens of millions of agents, like size of a country, uh, and be able to predict their behavior and interactions based on some, some closed loop data. So there is really an intersection of this emerging field of agent-based modeling with AI, because traditionally, as I said, they used to run really slowly, but now that we have tensorized uh, you know, with metrics vector multiplications of this representation of these agents, you know, we can run this thing you know, on very low compute, even on a laptop. And one of the things we did with this, just to kind of make it concrete, uh, is looked at how can we use agent-based modeling to deal with the pandemic. You know, there was this big debate between should you use a very fast antigen tests, which are slightly imprecise, or should you use very precise PCR tests, which are unfortunately so slow, could take two or three days to get back the results. Um, and our work ended up being used to make decisions that are worth billions of dollars of which types of tests uh, you should use. And the idea there is to predict the COVID spread 
that you know, based on this vaccination uh, policy or based on this, this testing policy uh, could, 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 could do. And again, the idea here is very similar to other machine learning problem, where you have to calibrate the models, you have to simulate the population behavior uh, with your network, and then you have to inform policy based on uh, you know, a loss function that you're measuring. So in case of COVID, based on number of cases, so number of deaths, uh, you can train a model to represent tens of millions of uh, individuals uh, in the population. So this is a very exciting time, whether it's, it's consumer behavior, whether it's ad targeting, whether it's supply chain, and any kind of policies. You know, should you have discounts? When should you open the stores? You know, when should you ship? All these ideas get embedded in the, within this world of intersection of agent-based modeling and AI. So let's look at the last vertical, which is the simulation unknown. And this is an extremely difficult topic. You know, the progress is just beginning uh, in these areas. And when simulation is unknown, you don't have this benefit of sampling efficiency, as we call in machine learning. Often you have to rely on examples and observations and experiences of somebody else, because you don't have the ability to have examples and experiences of your own to train the machine learning model. So how can we clear the global AI, right? So, you know, imagine I can, you know, I want to visualize this party, uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to encourage everybody else, you know, all the young kids who have celebrated their birthday to upload their photos, right, um, so that I can train a machine learning model, get all the data that's out there, is in the supply chain, in people's photos, ask people if they did shopping for birthdays or something else, so some classification, I can you know, collect all this data, I have photos of indoors, I have photos of, of you know, objects I'm selling in 3D, in 4D. I'm going to collect all these millions of petabytes of data. Then I'm going to train the best machine learning model that would tell me you know, what's, what are the products I should suggest for Maya's birthday. Then I would, uh, once that's trained, I'm going to deliver the solution uh, through the AI agent, uh, and, and Nia, the AI agent, is going to go and reward all the parents who were willing to share the photos of their own children and their own purchase history when they bought something for their birthday. And, uh, and those rewards could be through coupons or discounts or you know, some kind of a promotion. And finally, you know, I'm going to get you know, a really good option. So I'm going to see this in my house in an immersive fashion. I said, this whole Package is going to cost me $500. This one is glitzy. This one is, you know, matches Taylor Swift. And I'm going to get this, you know, highly interpretable, you know, decision-making power. And I can just click on it. And, you know, by the time I go home to Boston next week, you know, everything is delivered. Okay. This is a God's eye view into everything that's going on in people's lives and supply chains of organizations which Target may or may not have a view into. Uh, who's here going to be willing to upload all the pictures so they can be analyzed, right? This is very challenging. So the reality uh, of the God's eye view is that we cannot look at all the data. You know, privacy regulations is going to make it impossible. What does it even mean to train the machine learning model for just serving one customer at a time? That's not easy. Um, how would we reward the contributors, right? Because the contributions can come from various directions. Uh, and this is a classic problem even now with ChatGPT. You know, OpenAI is going to struggle, whether Wikipedia versus Reddit versus research papers, who should be paid when the regulations come in to be able to train these large language models? So any model that's sufficiently large that's going to ingest a lot of data, we have to figure out how do we pay for it. Uh, in this case, how do we pay the parents who are contributing their pictures? Uh, and then what does it mean to even suggest solutions because you want some counterfactuals, we on the what ifs, uh, and so on. So let's look at each of these uh, in quick succession because this whole field is the field of decentralized AI. Now, it also maps nicely to the world of Web 1, Web 2, Web 3. You might have heard about Web 1, Web 2 as kind of a read, you know, more like a CNN, websites, and so on. Web 2 is more like Facebook and Uber, where it's about platforms for collaboration, uh, and Web3 is like P2P collaboration, uh, cooperation. And most of Web3, unfortunately, has been tainted by really scammy things like cryptocurrencies and NFTs and virtual land and so on. And we're kind of a little bit jaded 
with that notion of Web3. The good news is that all that amazing craze um, in cryptocurrencies uh, and decentralization has built the perfect building blocks so that now we can actually use the same building blocks for decentralized AI. So again, for Web2, Web1, Web2, Web3, the progress has been connecting the data, the horizontal axis, but it's important for us to move on the vertical axis, which is the intelligence that's coming because we're connecting this data. So let's look at these four verticals with the lens of Web3 and decentralized AI. So there are four basic components of Web3, which is how do you aggregate data through pseudo-anonymity, how do you mine uh, those transactions and data through some kind of a ledger technology, uh, then we have reward, that's mainly through incentivization and game theory, and finally exchanges, you know, unfortunately exchanges like FTX played the role for, for, for that guidance. Again, we can take many of those components and upgrade them for decentralized AI through privacy tech instead of just pseudo-anonymity, verifiable decentralized AI, data markets, and CrowdX. So let's talk about these four uh, in quick succession. So the first is privacy. You know? Now, there's a classic trade-off between utility and privacy. Who here uses Google Maps or Waze to, to navigate? Uh, fortunately, Bangalore doesn't have as much traffic. <laughs> uh, and we willingly give away our GPS locations to Google so that Google can analyze and give us back highly personalized turn-by-turn directions of where to go. So unfortunately, giving up our privacy, but we're getting great utility in return. On the other hand, when, when something like health data, we are not willing to share our data, and that's why the progress in health AI is actually very, very slow, right? And we don't want to get the birthday AI to also be stuck on the bottom right, right? We want to be in the top right. And so new forms of privacy technologies are coming up uh, that would take us to this promised land of decentralized AI on the top right. And there are four major types of techniques in computational privacy. The first one is anonymity, which is not privacy at all, so I never recommend that. And the second one is the idea of obfuscation through differential privacy by adding noise. Uh, and for the best method is through encryption with techniques like homomorphic encryption or secure multi-party computation. The problem is if you look at the vertical axis, like what do you do with machine learning methods that are compatible with these, uh, with these uh, uh, privacy techniques, then we have you know, a classic Pareto curve. So to train the model, unfortunately, you cannot use encryption. Um, but two new techniques have emerged over the last five years. One is called federated learning uh, from Google, and another one is called split learning from our group uh, at MIT. And the key idea here is instead of sharing raw data, you share the wisdom from that data. And the wisdom doesn't bring you know, identifiable or reconstructable data, but only brings the wisdom. <clears throat> so federated learning, the idea is very simple. If you have all these clients, imagine you have all the parents with their photos of their children on each of their phones, you know, some third party can run a federated learning algorithm where the wisdom, which is how did this family celebrate their birthday for their child, and what products were used, and was this a successful birthday party or not so successful birthday party? You know, all that wisdom can be trained locally on each phone, and then only that trained model would be sent to the server, but not the photos themselves. So that's kind of the key idea behind federal learning, and it's, it's very powerful. Uh, the other technique is called split learning from our group at MIT, and here the idea is to actually take each photo and convert that into a smash representation and send only the smash representation to the server. So the federated learning method is kind of model parallel, and the split learning method is data parallel. And those of you who work in distributed computing are very familiar with the benefits and challenges of a model parallel versus data parallel methods. Now, the second problem here is, is leisure tech and how can they be used for verifiable deck AI, because NIA, the target AI agent, you know, is going to talk to multiple vendors. One vendor might be scanning objects, you know, one vendor might be dealing with photos on people's phone, another vendor might be dealing with supply chain AI, and so on. Now, if all of this has to come together, there's no guarantee, there's no proof that all those vendors are doing the right thing. Uh, and that's where the ideas from a ledger tech 
start applying to AI. But the problems are not about verifying transactions, but it's actually really verifying the data and AI. So was it trained? Was it trained on the data that you care about? Is the model that you're serving me has the same lineage that, uh, that I really care about? Um, how, when I said, give me the best model, are you giving the model that I really care about? And are you responding to the query and giving the results that, that I care about? Because even if the model is lying 5, 10, 20% of the time, that can you know, throw the whole system haywire because there's a lot, lot of incentive for the vendor AI to save on compute or data or you know, their accuracy uh, to, to serve, these, serve these queries. So that requires us to create automated AI because you're not going to go to the vendor and verify their AI models, but we're just going to send a small cryptographic puzzle to the vendor and do all this verification. And that brings the world of you know, meta learning or AI automating AI or AutoML, and our group was one of the first one uh, about seven years ago to invent, co-invent the field of automated machine learning. Uh, and the basic idea behind automated machine learning is to use a teacher-student network where the teacher network is spawning you know, several student networks, and the student network is performing a, a, a supervised learning task, uh, and the teacher network is using a reinforcement learning algorithm to quickly navigate through the space of all the possible student networks. So this is a very powerful technique that's used in many sectors now in neural architecture search and automated machine learning. The third problem is, you know, how are you going to pay off these patterns you know, with some kind of a reward? Right? Uh, and the way we're going to do that is, you know, uh, Nia, the target AI agent, has some data of birthdays and parties and what products are being used, and now has to negotiate with all the other parents' photos saying, I want your data as well. Now, a third-party vendor might have those photos that are um, uh, nicely curated, and so what I want to do uh, at Target is use my existing data to make a decision on buying the data from everybody else. So I, I have to correlate uh, with the data that's out there. Remember, I'm not able to bring the data centrally and then decide what the reward should be, right? Because if somebody's selling me data that's not images, I don't care. Even if they're images that are not about birthdays, I probably don't care. So, you know, there's a certain value I'm going to assign uh, to those photos or the information that's being shared or the purchase list. And using this correlation, I can estimate the value of the data that I cannot see, right? Just remember that. I'm going to create a dollar value for data that I cannot see. And this is the magic of uh, computational privacy. So a lot of work from our group and uh, other people in the world of creating data markets where the value is intrinsic data of the data, uh, intrinsic value of, uh, with, for machine learning. And then finally, you know, right now we use exchanges, which is a very, very poor way to look at everything that's out there. Uh, but we need to move away from the notion of UX and uh, UI design to the world of crowd UX and crowd UI. And again, those of you who use Waze or Google Maps uh, has a hint of it. It doesn't just show you the map, which should be UX, but it's a kind of a crowd UX because it also shows where everybody else is, right? So when I'm, when I'm visualizing the birthday party, I don't want to just see what is good for me, but also want to see how, what everybody else was doing you know, at that point. You know? So I want to have overlays of an amalgamation you know, of every other birthday party that's out there and what worked and what did not work for them. So you know, this hats, birthday hats had 66% you know, success, 66% uh, uh, contribution in the success for the birthday party. But then look at you know, this particular toy, actually it was you know, a disaster uh, for, for other parties. So I want to have this crowd UX uh, interface uh, as this goes as well. So I think we need to kind of rethink in the Web3 decentralized AI world, uh, what it means to design that UX. Uh, so we have a whole center at MIT on decentralized AI, uh, and now we're calling it decentralized society because the problems are not just about the AI, uh, but many other aspects of it. So go to dsocmit.org. So you know, when I go back to Boston next week, um, I know there's a lot going to happen underneath Nia, the target AI agent, whether simulation is known, approximate simulation is uh, only approximate simulation known or simulation unknown. 
I really don't want to bother about it. The really smart scientist at, at Target solving those problems because when I go home, all I'm going to say, hey, Nia, I'm home. Are you ready for the birthday party? Thank you.